Good afternoon. Uh, could you hear me? Saraji, could you hear me? Yes, madam, yes, can hear. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. I'm Dr. Padma Gunratna, President Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, I welcome all of you to the monthly clinical meeting uh, or the academic activity organized by the SLMA Expert Committee in Medical Rehabilitation. Uh, I, we would be addressing uh, one, I mean, a topic that would be essential for uh, someone with interest in medical rehabilitation. That would be assessment and management of spasticity. So before I introduce the speaker, may I uh, request all to mute your mics so that no one would be disturbed. Our speaker today is Dr. Nalinda Andravira, uh, MBBS, M, uh, Med uh, Medical Clinical Rehabilitation, F A F R M Royal Australasian College of Physicians, Senior Consultant Physician in Rehabilitation Medicine in Modbury Hospital, Adelaide, Australia. Uh, so may I invite Dr. Nalinda Andravira to commence the uh, presentation on assessment and management of spasticity. Over to you, Dr. Andravira. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, and I'm, I'm delighted to talk to you today. I was asked to um, target this uh, talk for rehabilitation med medicine registrars and uh, senior registrars. So I'll be uh, focusing um, from an exam perspective. If you know, if you see a patient, uh, what three months after a stroke in the post-stroke review clinic, and if the patient has uh, exaggerated tone or spasticity of the upper and lower limbs, uh, we will consider the upper limb first. This is the type of uh, upper limb view that you will see. The patient will walk to you with a adapted shoulder, flexed elbow, pronated forearm, wrist inflection, fingers on the palm, as well as thumb on the palm, and he'll be uncomfortable. And if you try to passively range these uh, segments, you'll find it there's a quite a lot of resistance. That's because of the nature of flexor tone being predominant in the upper limb. In contrast, the patient will walk to you with a circumducting gait on a with a stiff lower limb which acts as a strut. If you assess muscle segments, you might find hamstring spasticity, but primarily there'll be uh, gastrocnemius, soleus, as well as tibialis posterior spasticity kicking in, causing the ankle to be on plant affection and inversion. If you get this patient to walk, there'll be an asymmetrical uh, gait. He will struggle to clear the toes during the swing phase because of plantar flexion and inversion. The toes will catch the ground. This walking pattern will not be energy efficient, biomechanically abnormal. However, the patient will compensate with a bit of a hip flexion and a circumduction to clear the ground. So this is a typical upper limb and lower limb presentation that you will, uh, spasticity presentation that you will see in a post-stroke clinic. If you see a person with uh, hemiplegia uh, resulting from an upper motor neuron injury resulting in spasticity. How do we define spasticity? The best definition is by a neurologist called Dr. James Lance, 
He published a paper in 1980 and described spasticity as a motor disorder. And he mentioned it is a velocity dependent increase in tonic stretch reflex. He also said that this is driven by the hyper excitability of the stretch reflex. If I may repeat, it's a motor disorder, velocity dependent increase in tonic stretch reflexes driven by the hyper excitability of the stretch reflex. So this is the most accepted definition as at current. If we look at a simple monosynaptic stretch reflex, when a muscle fiber is stretched, that motion is picked up by the muscle spindle, an afferent signal is generated, sent to the spinal cord, and the interneuron connects that to the efferent, efferent uh, signal, which is sent to the muscle, for the muscle will contract. You will find in spasticity, this simple monosynaptic stretch reflexes is, has got grossly exaggerated and erratic and haphazard, and we will find out why. In defining pathophysiology of spasticity, the primary driver is when one has an upper motor neuron type of injury, the cortical control or the inhibitory control is not there. So at local level, at spinal uh, stretch reflex circuit level, there's no cortical inhibitory control. So it happens in an erratic, exaggerated fashion, driving spasticity. Additionally, there are some other factors which contribute to exaggeration of spasticity that occur in the spinal cord level. That's why we call it supraspinal lack of cortical control, uh, resulting in spasticity as well as spinal component of spasticity. In addition to that, there are some changes which are happening in a uh, paritic muscle, which also promotes exaggerated stress reflexes, driving spasticity. If you look at this flow chart, uh, imagine a person has had a stroke 12 weeks ago. It was a left MCA territory stroke with right-sided hemiparesis and hemianesthesia. So there's a loss of supraspinal or cortical control because there was a cortex was involved in this um, left MCA territory stroke and the exaggeration of stretch reflexes at the at each level happens. Additionally, at spinal level, there is a reduced reciprocal inhibition as well as decreased presynaptic inhibition of 1-8 afferent terminals. So this also contributes to exaggeration of spasticity. And if you look at the right arm of this flow chart, this person has hemiparesis, so that there's muscle weakness and disuse immobilization. When this happens at muscular level, there's muscle fiber atrophy, deposition of excess connective tissue. These factors makes the, the muscle less compliant, more stiff, which increases the spinal activity. So all, both these arms contribute to exaggeration of velocity dependent stretch reflux source and causing progressively worsening spasticity. Is it common after upper motor neuron type injury? Yes, it is common. After stroke, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy and multiple sclerosis. It's well documented, well researched, both in the pediatric uh, population with regard to cerebral palsy as well as volumes of literature in the adult population as well. So we come to the segment two of this talk, where we are going to assess, talk about the assessment of spasticity. 
think of a person you see in your clinic following a stroke. Same example, stroke happened three months ago, coming with uh, right upper limb spasticity. And as we described, you can see the position of the arm. But if you look at this person's hand, his right hand, the dominant hand, the fingers are tucked onto the palm, thumb is on the palm, very difficult to passively open the or stretch the, extend the fingers and clean the palm. And because of fingers tucked in, in there could potentially be skin maceration and it's foul smelling, moist um, and very painful for the patient. And if you assess this kind of focal spasticity, always make sure uh, to assess whether the person has a reasonable active motion of the other segments of the upper limb, which can be used for and targeted for some specific uh, activity uh, other than calling it a non-functional upper limb. And when you assess focal spasticity, assess each component. For, for example, in this hand, when we assess, we had to identify whether for the finger flexors, which is the primary driver, whether it is a flexor digitorum superficialis, which is primary flexing the metacarpophalangeal and proximal interphalangeal joints, or it is the flexor policies, uh, flexor digitorum uh, uh, FDP, which is um, flexor digitorum profundus, which flexes the terminal phalanges or the dis uh, distal interphalangeal joint, or whether this is a combination of both muscles severely involved. So it's important to identify which is which muscle is predominantly driving the spasticity component. Again, assess in human body muscles operate in pairs, agonist antagonist. So if the agonist muscle is the flexors, spastic uh, in this case, identify whether there's any motion or action preserved of the antagonist muscle. If there is, antagonist muscle is functional, it is a good predictor. And the last two is important in the initial assessment. Also identify if the patient has presented to you in a, in a later environment, unfortunately, whether the person is either having myostatic or joint contracture. In this case, the passive motion or passive ranging of this joint, it could be wrist or it could be the finger flexors, is not possible. So, and uh, its correction or improvement or getting functional activity is extremely difficult and impossible in this scenario because he was not picked, he or she was not picked up and managed properly earlier. Looking at spasticity assessment, there are two common tools or scales, modified Ashworth scale and modified Tardew scale. Modified Ashworth scale, some people call it subjective there are few authors who call it it's an assessment of tone. But if you look up recent literature in assessment of spasticity as initially as well as as follow up following treatment, the authors have used both these tools for assessment of spasticity, modified Ashworth as well as modified Tardew. If we describe modified Ashworth scale, Probably the best way of description is that we'll use the virtual reality. I want you to close your eyes and think that you are seeing a patient who has come four months after a stroke with uh, right upper limb spasticity. Now, so you remember the picture, and the elbow is in extreme flexion, and uh, patient says that it's very tight. I can't extend my elbow, it's very painful, and I find it difficult to do upper body dressing because I can't put this arm into the sleeve of my shirt. And can you please do something about this? So we do the normal routine as a clinician. We 
you know, have a build a rapport, tell the patient that we are doing some movement, although it is very stiff, you might feel it very, a little bit uncomfortable when we resist and pull against the uh, stiff muscles, but that is important for us to assess and um, make the patient either supine comfortably or if the patient is comfortable seated, we can do it in either way. We are going to passively range or extend this elbow, which is spastic because of the exaggerated spasticity of the elbow flexors. When you range it or extend it, like in the unaffected arm, if you can do it without any resistance, full range, up to the full range, there's no spasticity, body fat dash will scale zero. If you can do it easily towards the end range, but towards the end range, you find a resistance and, and a clear catch. You know, yeah, it stops because of the spasticity kicking in. And after that, you can still move without too much trouble up to the full range. That is modified as for scale one. And uh, the other step is that you can move it and towards the end range, you feel this resistance and the catch. After that, you can still move, but there's resistance after this initial catch, that is one plus. And two is that when you do this passive ranging of the uh, extending the elbow, working against the elbow flexors, you have continuous increase in muscle tone throughout most of the range of movement, but it still can be easily moved or passively ranged. So it is modified as well scale two. So to the, for the specific clinics, when I do that, most of the people get referred when the modified actual scale is, is about three, where there's a gross increase in muscle spasticity. Passive movement is difficult, but with force, we can still passively move it. So that is present throughout the range. So that is modified actual scale three. And the modified actual scale four is that it's in contracture, no passive motion is possible. I hope uh, you visualize this uh, assessment. It's subjective. However, when you identify the scale, it moves in a nice, uh, it has a nice flowing pattern. And if you remember the description, it should uh, provide a reasonable, Lee accurate assessment of spasticity based on uh, the scale as well as it will describe the tone as well. The modified Tardew scale, the second one, is the best scale because it's very objective. It defines what spasticity is because it is tested in two different velocities. We call it the slow motion where we range the limb as slowly as possible up to the point that we that stiffness or the spasticity or the catch comes in which we call the slow phase and after that we explain to the patient and do the same motion in a fast as possible or the fast phase to the to the speed that as if a blimp is falling free uh, with the gravity then we get the difference between these two assessments uh, these two angles, which will give us the spasticity angle. I will describe it in a graphical fashion, but would like to repeat that this is the best scale of spasticity assessment, objective scale, minimal error with regard to interrate and intrarate repeated assessments, always come up uh, with goniometer. Uh, angle measurements and we get a spasticity angle during this scale uh, using this scale. There are two lines of pictures on the left. We are testing the brachialis, an elbow flexor, and on the right we are testing biceps, which is elbow flexor as well as is a powerful supinator of the forearm based on the biomechanics and the insertion. So in the, if you follow the top picture on the left, 
you see that the assessor this person after a stroke the elbow is kind of bent up to minus 145 in its inflection with the slow ranging or slow passive extension assessor can get it almost to full zero uh, degree extension even though there's resistance but when the assessor does it in the faster phase high velocity phase the muscle spasticity elbow flexor spasticity kicks in earlier and the SS identifies a catch resistance at the angle of minus 80. So the angle difference from the slow phase zero to fast phase minus 80, which will give us a degree of 80, 80 degrees. This is our specificity angle. This is very significant. This can be treated with focal interventions like botulinum toxin as well as extensive targeted therapy so we are confident of a better outcome here we move to the three pictures on the right this time we are assessing i have isolated and assessing the other elbow flexor which is biceps remember it, it has a strong forearm supinate action as well the position is a little bit different it should be assessed at a pronate forearm pronated position to isolate the biceps same thing it's because the spasticity is bent at minus 135 so in the middle picture the slow velocity ranging we can get it up to minus 10 then the catch you detect at minus 10 and then we do the reassessment from the prior resting position and do the fast phase this time the biceps Spasticity kicks in because of the velocity much earlier. The catch is detected at minus 90. And again, the difference between these two assessments, the middle picture slow phase minus 10, the bottom picture fast phase is minus 90. So the difference is about 80 degree spasticity angle. Again, this angle is significant with botulinum toxin as a focal measure and therapy program we are hopeful of good outcomes because it's a significant angle but if you find that if we do this in a joint almost at about to uh, end up in contracture these two it's extremely difficult passive motion and you will find that there's very little movement possible and both the slow phase and the fast phase will will almost be the same angle that means we have very minimal or absent angle to treat so that's why it's important to identify this passivity angle this is always measured with a goniometer won't take much time need two people to uh, assess because one person is ranging other person so is measuring the uh, angle and recording and it's a very good tool and the same thing I will describe for the lower limb. Mind you, I'm just going to the previous slide. If you are treating this forearm, uh, upper limb, elbow flexors, biceps and brachialis, you have to remember one thing. Both have the same specificity angle, but if you are going to inject botulinum toxin, it is better to inject the bigger volume to brachialis and a lesser volume to biceps because we don't want to nullify the supinate action of biceps because otherwise there will be good outcome with regard to elbow flexor spasticity but the forearm will go into pronation so it's good it's always important to have an idea of the functional anatomy which muscle does which i'm coming back to the current slide so here the it shows uh, two pictures almost similar both on right three uh, three picture row and the left three picture row so what does the sister do this person following an upper motor neuron injury has a ankle in plant affection and a subtle bit of inversion so the assessor is trying the same doing the modified tardive scale 
pushing the passively ranging against spastic uh, ankle inverters mostly most of the time it's gastrocnemius so soles which are the bigger muscles and trying to force pull it push and get the angle the middle sort of slow phase the bottom line is the fast phase so still there's about a 25 degree angle which is significant and treatable same on the uh, other side uh, but here we have to make a plan to assist these two muscles together remember the two headed gastrocnemius is a two joint muscle it originates closer to the femoral condyles and uh, ends up as the achilles tendon but the soleus is a one joint muscle so the when we are assessing this if we assess the knee in a extended position and then assess the knee in a slightly bent about 15 to 20 degree bent position in the bent position you are nullifying the action of gastrocnemius because it will not be dynamically acting anymore so in the knee bent 15 to 20 degree bent position you are only assessing the soleal spasticity but in the extended position you are taking the gastrocnemius is taking over so this way you can identify which of the two muscles is contributing more to this uh, spasticity um, segment that is seen in the plantar flexion of the ankle and if you put this scale on paper it's uh, long and boring but it's important to identify the steps so what we did we were passively raging against resistance first assessment as low as possible second assessment as fast as possible and we qualify the quality of muscle reaction if there's no resistance beautiful modified tire risk is zero if there's slight resistance throughout with no clear catch at an precise angle it's one if there's a clear catch that means sudden stop because of the tightening or the specificity it's modified as a scale modified sorry modified tardive scale two and number three if there's a fatigable clonus lasting less than 10 seconds is modified tardive scale three and if there's unfatigable clonus lasting 10 seconds it's modified tardive scale four and if the joint is immobile it's five and while doing that the most important thing is we are calculating the spasticity angle as i described which is important to predict treatment outcomes hope i made it clear so we are testing the modified cardio scale the better out of the two scales the objective out of the two scales to assess spasticity so I will take a break now and let you look at these three pictures in clockwise fashion and uh, identify which muscles are getting tested. All right, in the, the top picture, obviously, it's the wrist flexors. So the person is ranging against the spastic wrist flexors, so testing flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. In the second one, bottom right, the assessor is stabilizing the contralateral pelvis and moving the affected uh, lower limb or abducting the affected side hip and what is he testing is the hip adductor spasticity. So the hip adductor spasticity is a functionally important component because if there's a exaggerated hip adductor spasticity, there can be scissoring of the gait and the perineal cleaning will be difficult. So it's an important component that can be treated. And in the bottom left, the last one, clockwise, what's the muscle the person is assessing as we described he has nullified the gastrocnemius function by bending the knee and he's assessing his, his 
passively ranging ankle into dorsiflexion, so basically assessing the soleal or soleus spasticity. And um, this one, I in the middle, before we go to the next section, I thought like uh, when we travel here, it's a big country, and every small town, every, every big town, uh, they are commemorating their soldiers who died uh, 100 and plus years ago in the First World War and uh, 70 plus years ago in the Second World War. Now all the names are polished and the volunteers come and clean this monument on a weekly basis. School kids come and uh, listen to the stories about them which are plucked and uh, described. I think uh, we should do the same in Sri Lanka. Now I come to my next uh, description. Before I go to the management, there's a bit of a dilemma in treating spasticity because as, an assess, as, a, as, a, as the assessing team, we have to make sure all the assessments and treatment plan does provide functional benefit. And as we described briefly earlier, spasticity, especially of the lower limb, helps the person to weight bear to walk with a circumducting gait helps that lower limb to work as a strut in weight bearing. So we should not inject or weaken these muscles and cause more harm. So it's good to identify the ankle inverter predominantly involved or plantar flexor predominantly involved and inject that and get a more biomechanically correct gait than treating all the spastic components including hamstrings and larger muscles which will not, which will cause the person considerable weakness and won't allow him to weight bear. So this is, you always remember in the treating the lower limb, don't nullify any benefits uh, of weight, uh, that are there for weight bearing. Again, some authors say that the spasticity helps in maintaining muscle bulk. These muscle spasms and movement helps in preventing deep vein thrombosis. And obviously, uh, with lower limb uh, spasticity, the lower limb acts as a strut with the extensors spastic. And uh, when they weight, weight bear, maybe even five to 10 meters, or even stand against the rail, that is weight bearing exercise and prevent osteoporosis. And in additionally, um, if you find a person suddenly becoming acutely having exaggerated spasticity, that gives us a clue to identify whether there's a noxious stimuli like bladder irritation, urinary tract infection, which is undetected, fecal impaction, uh, even a small um, uh, peripheral element like an ingrown toenail or skin breakdown, which drives this spasticity component uh, in an exaggerated fashion. So there are some benefits. Complications, obvious. If you don't treat, end up in muscle contracture. Passive ranging not possible, very difficult to get any functional improvement after that. And the limb is uh, very, I would say not a good term, but deformed and altered body mechanics, not energy efficient and a lot of pain from muscle spasms. And if you consider the hip adductors, very difficult to go and clean the perineum area because the adductor Muscles keep on spasming and difficult to part the legs to reach the perineum. And uh, bed, during bed mobility, when you have spastic upper and lower limb, uh, there's a lot of friction forces can cause uh, pressure ulceration. And these people, however cognitively intact they are, and however keen they are to participate in a therapy program, are unable because even passive ranging is difficult. So they are obviously have a low self-image and quite in low mood. Now we come to our last segment, which is management. Of so the management, we always talk about the positive aspects of upper motor neuron injury, that spasticity is a component. So it could be increase in muscle tone, exaggerated spasticity, muscle spasms, which bothers the patient at night, dystonia, exaggerated tendon reflexes that we know during examination as well as 
clones. They are all positive phenomena of an upper motor neuron lesion. But always remember that we are targeting our treatment to treat that and enable patient a better outcome. But the same limb which has shows all these upper motor neuron phenomena which are positive, we call it positive in the sense that they are positive features of upper motor neuron phenomena. This limb is weak and the moment they use it for something because of abnormal biomechanics they get easily fatigued so it's very important to incorporate as much as possible muscle motion as well as put them in an energy conservation plan you know sort of so that they can do some functional activity conserving some energy for them to be functional and in management if you don't identify the issues initially and start a proper multidisciplinary treatment program they will come next time in contracture so it's important the initial assessment is done thoroughly in a multidisciplinary fashion i usually do it with a senior physiotherapist and a senior occupational therapist the occupational therapist is very important when the upper limb uh, is involved and we have a we formulate a treatment plan and a management plan for, during the initial assessment and document it and get the patient family and if they have carers involved i, I thought that's uh, it's done uh, universally uh, it's, it's very important so for the registrars and the senior registrars if you are asked about managing specificity one single phrase is multimodal Always put the physiotherapy and occupational therapy interventions are very vital in preventing exaggerated spasticity and in maintaining the function. And always have an idea whether the part, person is cognitively intact. There's not much, you know, sort of cortical involvement that the patient is cognitively very, very uh, deficient so that the patient can be incorporated in a therapy plan, will be you can train him he will understand your instructions so that is very good that's very positive in the, in the approach and if you find that the focal muscular segment is involved the best way is to treat it focally using botulinum toxin and always get clear-cut functional goals uh, and it has been propose that we have to get it from the get goals from the patient's subjective description say for a, as a team we might want the elbow to be uh, to be able to be better arranged so that we can extend it uh, without too much uh, specificity related resistance but the patient simply wants to put his arm in the shirt sleeve and wear the shirt so that it's not painful for him so if you incorporate that into the program and you will say that, okay, we are going to do um, injections and do, you have to do lots of, lots of therapy with, with, with us so that we are going to achieve this in a, in a, in a stipulated period of time. He'll be happy because that is what we want and we match his uh, goal with the program and always set patient centered goals. In description of the multimodal approach, the therapy interventions are really important. So passive stretching reduces tone, increases range of motion, and it's important to get an occupational therapist or a hand therapist involved, especially with the uh, wrist and finger flex or uh, spasticity that because resting splints uh, and dynamic splints are very important. And uh, always add education of the patient, family, and the carers in your answer, because if you educate them, you are empowering them, and they'll be more receptive, and they'll have better compliance. And the physical therapy should be targeted because each individual is different. The, the element of spasticity is different, and their subjective goals are different. So they should have a tailored therapy program. And the functional electrical stimulation, as well as transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation of both the spastic muscle as well as the antagonic muscle, antagonistic muscle is beneficial. 
and tens has the added benefit that it relieves pain. Going to medical interventions, so you, in the pharmacological in, interventions, we have two arms uh, where we can treat with medications, you know, baclofen, benzodiazepines, um, dantrolene, or when it is focal, the best approach is botulinum toxin, as I mentioned. And despite intensive therapy program, commencement of antispastic medications, if there's a really poor outcome, and if we can define this particular person has some active motion, and if this particular joint is um, you know, treated, he could potentially have a better outcome. We can always discuss with the orthopedic surgeons and get in their views and you know they, they have been always receptive to uh, do uh, tendon release tendon transfers and if necessary arthrodesis to enable functional better functional outcomes and lastly especially in the people with severe traumatic brain injury who have gross spasticity uh, not enabling them even to be seated on a power chair we cannot treat with medications because they will need large doses so that it's not possible to tolerate the adverse effects of such large doses and uh, we cannot inject focally all the muscles involved because there are gross multifocal involvement and to improve their quality of life the intrathecal therapies are each and every, every uh, component uh, rapidly. Pharmacology, I'm going to be very fast because you know everything about the medications. Uh, you can use baclofen, benzodiazepines, dantrolene, tizanidine, and gabapentine in that uh, uh, in treatment. So, baclofen, which is uh, acts to um, inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, which is analog of GABA. Plasma half-life is short. Can start with a small dose and ramp up based on the response. Always educate the patient on the unwanted or adverse effects and uh, tell the patient that abrupt discontinuation is not good. We have to taper it because otherwise there will be rebound spasticity and seizures are possible. And up to about 80 milligrams per day, the adult person will tolerate well. But if you go above that, there'll be a more, um, you know, sort of a compounding adverse effect profile. Benzodiazepines, we all know, um, again, it's a GABA uh, analog. Problematic in the elderly population, um, you know, sort of when they are, you know, their cognition, uh, their reaction time, reflexes can be impaired and cause them to have more force, so pretty, pretty risky in that population unless you do very uh, minute doses at night time. Again, abrupt discontinuation causes withdrawal issues. But one thing is clonazepam uh, gives them reasonable benefits if they have nocturnal spasms due to spasticity, spas uh, exaggerated uh, spasticity and spasms. Either medicate tablet form uh, at night or like uh, clonazepam drops at night uh, have been used uh, with good effect. Pizanidine, uh, I don't use that because it's not registered and the PBS in Australia, but it's used in New Zealand. It uh, works with a, as an alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist, reduces uh, muscle spasticity, similar side effect profile, but there's a transient heterotoxicity, so uh, we have to do a liver profile initially and monitor um, for any uh, heterotoxicity. Dantrolene is unique because it acts peripherally. Action comes from inhibition of uh, release of calcium ions from the sarcoplastic reticulum during excitation contraction coupling, so there will not be any calcium released, uh, and that's how it acts. Half-life is longer, dosing starting small and going up, 25 milligram and ramping up. 
similar site adverse effects profile heterotoxicity is uh, documented adverse effects you have to monitor the liver profile a baseline as well as during treatment because it is well documented that it's separate gabapentin again it uh, potentiates the gaba action similar adverse effects profile coming to focal specificity treatment so the evidence is level one with multi-center trials as so you can start bottle treating with botulinum toxin a how it acts is uh, the botulinum toxin a when injected intramuscularly uh, blocks uh, or cleaves this uh, snap 25 uh, cleavage protein as you can see on the right uh, picture right sided picture and this will once the snap 25 is not there the synaptic vesicle containing acetylcholine will not be able to bind to the membrane and release acetylcholine so this way there's a conduction block happens which can last three to six months so that's how the the stiffness or the spasticity gets reduced allowing more therapy to be done to improve the range and the function and in the clinic uh, i do um, that have done it since 2016 so uh, has a good referral base now and uh, these are the tools uh, that are used uh, so you uh, use both the neurostimulator which is in the middle as well as uh, ultrasound guided injections so neurostimulator is very handy because um, it can be connected to this uh, injection needle which is a filament like a 25 20, sorry 27 gauge needle and once the uh, with surface marking once i'm in the muscle you can send a small electrical stimulation and see the muscle contracting so that it's it's a guided uh, accurate injection especially valuable if, if we are giving injecting um, um, flexor digitorum superficialis for example so that's a quite superficial in the forearm originates from the common flex origin and once i mean give a small sap as me call it and you can see the metacarpophalangeal and the proximal interphalangeal flexing it confirms the that i'm in the muscle and can inject uh, maintaining a uh, aseptic field however for um, especially people with cerebral palsy uh, they don't tolerate injections without sedation that well um, especially the nerve simulation can be can be frightful for them so ultrasound scan comes into play and i'm not a skilled uh, ultrasound uh, person yet but i use it uh, for bigger muscles quite often So pharmacology profile of botulinum toxin just briefly going through uh, indications for focal spasticity contraindications few if the patient doesn't give consent we can't inject if there's a local infection in the injection area we cannot inject and uh, if there are neuromuscular junction pathologies um, lambert eaton myotin syndrome myasthenia gravis or other uh, rare conditions we have to always go through the background medical history cannot inject the internalization is from intramuscular injection and it diffuses along the muscle physiological effect in three days peak effect in three weeks duration of action three to six months so easy to remember three days three weeks three to six months adverse risk profile uh, if the technique is good very minimal even when the patients are on anticoagulants we can inject because it's a tiny 27 gauge needle and if the patient is in warfarin make sure that INI is not very high around 2 2.5 would be a good good target and should not inject too frequently leave at least a three month gap or usually leave a six months gap because if you inject frequently without maintaining a three-month gap between uh, injections 
the body makes antibodies and the efficacy will not be there for the subsequent so evidence as published for botulinum toxin for treating smoker spasticity, reducing spasticity, it has level one evidence. Improving impairment, it has high level of evidence. However, improving function, variable because of the patient compliance and the, um, is an issue. So if you maintain a very good targeted therapy program, if the patient is motivated to maintain compliance, that's the only way we can get the function constantly improved. And additionally, via C fibers, it will give some pain relief as well. Dosage is usually 400 units per session. So we have to distribute 400 units of Botox among the targets. post botulinum toxin management, I cannot highlight, uh, emphasize this enough. Therapy is a must. If you, if you inject botulinum toxin and the patient goes without a therapy program, we are wasting money. So whenever we inject, make sure the patient has, uh, you do a multidisciplinary assessment and ask your therapy team to plan out, formulate a targeted therapy program, at least for the first six to eight weeks, so that the patient will get the best benefit of injection and review them and uh, see how, how the participation and the compliance has been. Otherwise, it is it's going to be a uh, wasteful exercise. And when do we review uh, the best evidence is uh, maybe six to eight weeks because uh, peak action comes in three weeks. They continue therapy for about another five weeks. Review at eight weeks. The good thing about it is even though we have not achieved some of the targets, we can re-modify the therapy plan because the duration action lasts for about 12 to 16 plus weeks. So there's some more time. Repeat injections, minimum gap of three months for botulinum toxin. Just a simple graph to show that it's intramuscular injection. And uh, clinicians in North America, um, rehab physicians uh, talk about injecting motor points, but looking at muscle physiology, there are no well-defined motor points. So the best practice scenario is to inject to the widest bulk of the muscle good volume, adequate volume, uh, adequate dosage, and let it diffuse. If it's a bigger muscle, you can inject two points of the bulk, which is uh, acceptable practice. Intrathecal baclofen are not experienced. I've seen only two. This is for severe spasticity, both the patients of severe traumatic brain injury. They had intolerable side effects to medications. And the value is that when you have intrathecal baclofen, you can deposit microdoses of baclofen to the site of action and spasticity can be released with very minimal doses of baclofen. And the adverse effects profile is much lower because the medication dosage is small. However, before we go for a pump, always make sure that the intrathecal catheter is put and he, the patient is given test doses of baclofen from 25 mm microgram uh, increments and assess whether the spasticity reduced by at least one component in assessment like modified Asheville scale or modified Tardew scale. That means the patient is responding, so it is worthwhile the investment in putting up so pumps are usually in a, a skin pouch, um, subcutaneous uh, in the hypochondri right hypochondrial uh, area, and the catheter is wired to be in the intrathecal. And uh, the pump can be programmed with a telemetry operated system, and drug delivery can be delivery rate can be changed as well using external telemetry operated device. Intrathecal test doses, as we, as I mentioned, is very important to check the effectiveness for before the pump is inserted. Complications: It's an invasive procedure, so uh, infections, equipment-related problems such as the catheter blockages and kinking, but usually the 
pumps are quite technologically advanced, so they beep and notify if there's a delivery problem. An abrupt discontinuation can be uh, dangerous. Uh, however, the pump alarm will uh, notify the patient or the care. When we have done everything, absolutely wonderful therapy program, medications on board, focal specificity treated with botulinum toxin. However, the patient's response is minimal when you see the patient six to eight weeks down the line. Always look for compliance as well as identify whether there was an ongoing undetected urinary tract infection or any noxious stimuli where the spasticity, you know, sort of just driving in. And, uh, you know, these are easily treated and um, can be, program can be redefined and reassessed this way. Compli ensuring compliance is, has been a major problem. If you read, there's a lot of literature with regard to how to enable better compliance. It's a challenging scenario, but it, that's why it's very important for the therapy team to get really build a good rapport with the patient and the family and the carers to ensure that your hard work is continued. In summary, I have tried to describe a velocity dependent increase in muscle tone and hyper excitable stretch reflex as a definition mentioned in one slide that spasticity can be useful, especially for weight bearing. Describe the clinical presentation of spasticity, both upper and lower limb. Assess the objective assessment of spasticity using modified actual scale and tardive scale. Discussed multimodal treatment options. Touch based on medications and their effectiveness as well as adverse effect profile. Discuss focal management options, botulinum toxin A, and the level of evidence for that. Briefly discuss intrathecal baclofen and mention that when all the options fail and when there are, when there are functional goals, discuss with our surgical colleagues in all the periods, they'll be able to, you know, discuss, have a good two-way communication and come up with a plan. If the, in some of these fellowship questions, there are some administrative or service improvement questions. So if you ask about a question on setting up a subspecialty or setting up a service, uh, the best way to answer is that always uh, look up uh, how the referrals are coming, how to establish a referral base for you to run the clinic. There needs you need patients. If you get patients only that the funding will come through. So look for networking for a referral base and always have a multidisciplinary team ready, well-trained physiotherapist, occupational therapist together with you uh, and a, a nurse practitioner uh, with regard to uh, injections and other day-to-day um, -day functional assessments. Formulate a management plan always and the initial assessment should be very thorough and well documented and always use, uh, we call it GAS scores, they are called goal assessment scores as described. We assess the patient, grade the specificity, have a goal sheet after discussion with the patient and the family and the carers and document it on the very first day and this is what we revisit during follow-up. Uh, examinations and ensure that you educate the patient and the family and the carer so that that's the best way of ensuring. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and uh, it was a delight to talk to you and I come home uh, almost every year. My extended family is in Sri Lanka but uh, due to the current situation I could not make it but I'm very happy to catch up with uh, any of you uh, down the line when I come back home. I'll give my email for any contacts uh, and take care and stay safe.
thank you very much, Nalinda, uh, for that excellent overview of uh, spasticity, assessment of spasticity and management of spasticity. I'm sure we all benefited by your excellent le lecture. Um, I have a few questions. I know that some of them you have answered already in the chat box, but there was one question on focal dystonia. How does uh, botulinum toxin help in focal dystonia? Is there a possibility uh, to put yep. botulinum toxin? Yes, um, Saraji, so thanks for inviting me. And then um, I think my experience is, uh, Saraji, is, is my audio clear or? Yes, yes, it's yes. clear. Yes. Yeah. So the, my experience is Saraji, like, you know, sort of uh, unlike, you know, like if you inject a writer's cramp, uh, you know, with botulinum toxin, you know, usually you get very good results. But if you, uh, uh, if I, uh, I have injected, uh, you know, sort of uh, several patients following, you know, upper more neuron injury or stroke related dystonias, but the results are a little bit mixed. Uh, some people did respond well, some people did not. So, uh, um, the, I would say it's a bit skeptical, you know, you know, sometimes I would say 50-50. Okay, right. Thank you. Uh, and there are a few more questions. I think most of them you have answered. Um, yeah. Uh, about uh, the splinting and the serial casting. There's a question on splinting and serial casting for the benefit of everyone. I'm just asking the question again, uh, whether, uh, which is superior? Yeah, so that's, uh, I actually try to answer while listening. So uh, it's a, I mean, to be frank, it's a tough question. So I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the key things, I think one of the uh, uh, one, one of the ladies in the audience actually commented on it, uh, I saw uh, in, in text. So one of the problems in serial casting is, uh, Saraji, that, the uh, you know, you inject botulinum toxin, get a, some kind of a limited range, and then put the serial cast on the, uh, at that range. And after after time, we review them again and do a therapy program. If there's a little bit more movement, we put that serial casting at that extended or uh, improved motion. So, uh, so the person has to be really compliant because it's not uh, very easy to wear the cast uh, continuously. They can be itchy, you know, a little bit painful and, uh, you know, sort of, so people, uh, patients don't tolerate it that well. And uh, additionally, when you have a serial casting, you are basically restricting all the kind of the, even the limited motion that the person can have. So basically can result in muscle weakness, definitely. So I thought like uh, I, uh, we have done serial casting for maybe five, six people because our occupational therapist is really um, uh, keen on that when all the other options fail. Uh, but um, we, uh, we multiple factors needs to be considered before we do that. Primarily, whether we have done all the other primary uh, uh, therapy uh, beforehand, like sprinting, you know, good, good, uh, you know, ranging and uh, uh, stretching program, and everything has. Uh, if everything has failed, then uh, potentially we can consider severe casting. But before that, we have to. Uh, uh, educate the patient as well as uh, warn them that this is going to be a big commitment and go forward from there. Okay. Uh, and what is, I uh, just one question from me. What is your experience uh, on gabapentin uh, with the reduction of the... Yes, I'll be, <laughs> Saraj, I'll be absolutely truthful here. So what happens is that here, when I do a spasticity clinic, uh, primarily... Uh, all the patients that uh, who get referred to me are coming for injections. I focus specificity. So medications wise, I only play with uh, uh, baclofen and benzodiazepines. So I have not uh, put anybody on gabapentin to be frank. So I just basically uh, titrate the uh, baclofen and uh, uh, benzodiazepine and I inject and review. Uh, but I know some people have uh, used gabapentin, uh, but I, I don't know how much or uh, how much effective it, it can compare to the other, other ones. Uh, maybe, a, maybe a neurologist uh, uh, would be would be better probably. <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 don't, I don't have much experience. Yeah, no problem. That's fine. Uh, okay, I think uh, that's about it. And I would like to thank Mrs. Lakshmi Jayalath actually for uh, inviting yes. you uh, initially. So thank you, Lakshmi. Uh, and it was an excellent lecture. Thank you very much from all of us uh, all right. at the expert committee in medical rehabilitation in SLMA.
Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Saraji. And then, then one, um, I think probably when I recorded, uh, there was one probably a small um, mistake, like, you know, sort of with the surgical referrals, I think it's most of the time, um, both the hand surgeons and the orthopedic surgeons, uh, you know, are the key people that we interact with. So hand surgeons uh, are another uh, important group uh, when you have to discuss surgical options, uh, not only orthopedic uh, uh, consultants. So uh, anyway, thanks, Saraji, and thanks, Lakshmi, and, and to Madam Parmagunta as well. It was uh, a pleasure doing and seeing you all. Thanks. Thank you.